Ideas debate. I'm William Wallace. I'm the chair of the Ideas Board, uh, and I used to think of myself as a political scientist. Although I, I introduced a political scientist member of the House of Lords to someone from Princeton today to say, "Look, there are lots of these political scientists and Lords, isn't it good?" To which uh, this other professor said rather stiffly, "Well, we think of William Willey as international relations, not political science." Um, in the LSE, as you know. Uh, the government department and the international relations department have much closer and more uh, easy relations than that. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the United States uh, in a world of crisis and the question of how does the United States manage the crisis and the rise of other powers. And I've just thrown at, at both of our uh, speakers the question, how do you manage without the United States as a hegemon? Uh, would the world be a little uncomfortable if we didn't have the United States to lead and to blame? Uh, Professor Danny Kwa is the uh, chair of the economics department here and has advised the Treasury and a range of other uh, bodies. He was born in Malaysia, knows um, global economics as well as he knows British economics, and he's going to talk first about the economic dimension of this and then my colleague, Professor Mix Cox, who is the Joint Director of Ideas and a Professor of International Relations here, is going to talk about some of the more political and geopolitical dimensions of the situation as we find it. Danny. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The question that's before us this evening is whether the U.S. continues to be hegemon. And by that, I mean imperial leader over nation states in the rest of the world that are de facto subordinate to the United States. And we're asking this question in a world where the current global economic crisis has, in my view, both its cause and its initial appearance within the United States itself. This global economic crisis has devastated world trade it has increased global poverty, and it has damaged international economic development. The resulting financial insecurities are hampering innovation in much needed technologies to tackle global climate change. Moreover, and somewhat paradoxically, given its initiation and its first manifestation, this crisis is also almost surely one where the savior of the global economy will not be the United States this time, but instead an economy 10,000 kilometers away from Washington, D.C., an economy that has quietly and steadily been saving, growing, piling up financial reserves, and dare I say, generating economic goodwill towards it throughout much of the rest of the world. Given this confluence of both fact and effect, on which I will now elaborate, I think it quite likely that indeed the US hegemon is in decline. If so, the question that's before us now is how we deal with the current crisis, where the current crisis is both symptom and accelerator of that decline. What are the facts and effects that I have in mind that bring me to this conclusion? Well, even before the collapse running up through September last year of trillion dollar financial institutions in the US, that economy, the US economy, no longer appeared to be the vibrant one that towards the end of the 19th century had taken world leadership in the friendliest way possible out of the hands of the British. The fact is, after that, for pretty much the entire 100 years, the US was the single country more powerful 
than any conceivable coalition of other nations in the world. But take your mind forwards, zipping through the 20th century, and consider the economic reality over the last three years. Take, for instance, 2006. Now, I choose that year because 2006 comes at the end of two decades of profligate national overconsumption and extreme financial engineering in the United States. The fact of the matter is, by 2006, the US was running a trade deficit against the rest of the world that amounted to over $800 billion, or 7% of US GDP, or more than the entire national output of the country of India. This year, 2009, the US government's fiscal deficit might be as large as double that 2006 trade deficit. The US government has borrowed massively, not just from its own citizens. For the last four years, foreign buyers have purchased 80% of the total sales of US government treasury bonds. So that by 2008, the world's leading holder of US treasuries was China with $585 billion worth. Number two was Japan with almost the same amount. And I'll give you a guess who number three turns out to be. Well, yes, that turns out to be us, Britain. Britain is the world's third largest holder, third largest foreign holder of US Treasury bonds. Moreover, this year, the US central bank is targeting interest rates to basically 0%. And it's providing quantitative easing for purchasing up to $1.5 trillion of mortgage-backed securities in an attempt to kickstart the US housing market. On top of all this, whether or not we apply the official label, the fact is the US government is, by stealth, nationalizing large chunks of its banking and automotive and other heavy metal industries. That is to say, those chunks of those industries that aren't already owned by the rest of the world. For this last decade, the US has been on a path of aggregate consumption and financial innovation that has relied on massive cash infusion from the rest of the world, not just in the normal course of events in the form of international trade and finance, but also from sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf, in Singapore, and in China. Of course, every now and then, in flagrant violation of the ethos of globalization, the US will turn up its nose at other people's sovereign assets, like when China National Offshore Oil Corporation tries to buy Unical Oil, or Dubai Ports World seeks to provide management for US ports. Where do I come to at the end of this recital of economic fact? In the real world, if any other country had attempted to come close to these kinds of numbers and this type of behavior, that nation's currency would now be worth next to nothing. The IMF would be sniffing about, mumbling structural reform <laughs> and asking for drastic domestic belt tightening. This has not happened because the US dollar remains the world's reserve currency. A devaluation of the US dollar would have serious global repercussions, not least on China, Japan, and us, with our massive holdings of US Treasury debt. A 20% fall in the value of the US dollar would remove in one fell swoop 
200 billion dollars from the wealth of China and Japan, 50 billion pounds from the United Kingdom, pretty much the total amount that the UK had set aside for its own quantitative easing in the first instance. The special relationship between the UK and the US is one where not only has this country's government bankrupted all of us, it also stands ready to let the US government bankrupt all of us. What should we do coming out of this? Is there an alternative to this US hegemony that has held for much of the last 100 years? I would claim that there is, although we do need to proceed cautiously. There was, not so long ago, a time when hubris surrounded Japan's imminent assumption of world economic leadership. Japan, of course, subsequently suffered a lost decade or two with zero economic growth. The only other candidate to this kind of world economic leadership right now is China. Now, of course, claims abound in the world on other than purely economic terms why China cannot be trusted to take this world leadership. Claims abound more generally that China is ruled by a nuclear-armed communist dictatorship, even though today it probably has the freest capitalist markets in the world. Some say that China, cynically, in exchange for oil, power, and influence, is in breach of different US arms embargoes not least because it has supplied weapons to the Sudanese government to deploy in Darfur. Some claim that China is using a string of pearl strategy, building alliances throughout the Middle East and Africa into Southeast Asia to satisfy China's ever-growing demand for natural resources. Some point out how the environment in China is worsening by the day with that country already containing 16 out of the world's 20 most polluted areas. In the midst of all of this, I simply point out that pretty much uniformly in all of its relations with the rest of the world, China is driven by purely economic ideas. It wants to prosper economically it needs to prosper economically to continue to be a country where its government is legitimized by its people. But what a glorious legitimization that has been for the last three decades. In the last 25 years, China has brought 627 million of its people out of extreme poverty, more than the rest of the world combined, double the population of the United States. On average, China's people still only have 1 14th the per capita income of the United States. Yet, in normal times and at market exchange rates, China, through buying Boeing wide body jet aircraft, through buying French and Italian designer fashion and Nokia cell phones, already provides the global economy 54% of the boost to world economic growth, as does the United States. We're talking here about many people at levels of income where the choice before them of economic progress and economic growth is very simple. Many of these people live at levels of poverty still that are undreamed of in the Western world. All that they want to do is experience more economic growth. No one in those circumstances 
turns down the offer of a modern refrigerator and a flush toilet. Chinese economic growth at this point is about delivering these kinds of goods and services and its dealings with the rest of the world is built on ever greater economic efficiency and ever greater economic collaboration. And I suggest to you that that is a much safer and less harmful way to run the world. Thank you. Dana is one of the last standing economists at the LSE after the crisis, and when the Queen asked him, why didn't you predict it? Danny, I think, at least had an answer. And I think your answer was you didn't know. Um, <laughs> it's, not also, it's also not the first time that I've spoken here to, uh, at the LSE about the United States. In fact, I was going back through my notes some years ago, five or six years ago, and uh, when we were talking about the United States then, back in 2003, 2004, and all I can reflect now is, my goodness, how times have changed. And how the themes of uh, thinking about the United States have so changed as well. Then all the talk back in 2002 and 3 was about the American Empire and the new Rome on the Potomac. Now it's all about whether or not the United States can avoid a potential crash and decline. Then all the talk was about war, going to war, uh, the revolution in military technology, of course prior to Iraq and after Afghanistan. Now... It's all about economics. Nobody's interested in war any longer, it seems. And then, of course, and I suppose this is at least progressive, then it was all about Bush. Now it is all about Barack Obama. There are many virtues, it seems to me, and possibly even as many downsides of being the only uh, serious global actor in the international system. And I suppose the only serious global actor in the international system, at least since 1945, and certainly since the end of the Cold War, has been the United States. The question is, will it remain so? Now, what are the downsides of being the only serious global actor? And I was trying to feel sorry for the United States just for a few minutes. Well, the first downside, it seems to me, is that most obviously, uh, very few people will really like you, <clears throat> even though they pretend to. Generally speaking, people like small countries, uh, like Ireland, uh, pretty countries, like Switzerland, countries where the food is good, like Italy, or nice moral countries like New Zealand and Canada. So that's one of the downsides. Nobody would really ever like you because you're the hegemon. Uh, secondly, you will get blamed for everything, uh, from AIDS in Africa to causing hurricanes in the Atlantic. Uh, you are perceived as all-powerful, almost omnipotent, and as such, you'll always get it in the neck when things go wrong. You'll very rarely get praised when things go right. And finally, uh, this may be my kind of peculiar psychology and my peculiar way of thinking about the world. Finally, one of the downsides of being number one is that most people seem to get pleasure when you do rotten things, like invade Iraq and torture al-Qaeda suspects, and they don't get much pleasure when you do good things, like promote democracy and try your soldiers in a court of law. Basically, people generally think the worst of great powers. And for an understandable reason, if you think about it, it's got nothing to do with the United States. We are supposed to live in a world of equal sovereign states, and we don't. As the British discovered, and I'm not bound to make this analogy at least once tonight, I won't do it again, as the British discovered when they ran their empire, there's no point being liked. The best you can hope for is to be respected and at the same time to act smart rather than dumb, which was always Bush's problem. <laughs> now, the virtues of being the great power, of course, are equally obvious. If you've got to take all this flack from Canadians and everybody else, uh, there must be some good, there's got to be a good side to all this. And they are pretty, pretty big, let's be honest. Uh, first of all, everybody wants to go to your party, 
and you get lots of invitation to go to other people's parties. Perhaps even more important, you can push people around, even invade their countries sometimes. And finally, perhaps most important of all, you have the added psychological benefit of being number one, the best, a winner, not a loser. Ask the average American, would you prefer to be a Canadian or an American? And he or she will look at you as if you are quite mad even to ask the question. Which leads me, I suppose, logically and in a roundabout way to the question I want to discuss tonight. Will people want to go to America's party? Will the US still be invited to other people's party? And will they remain number one in the future? Let me say firstly and quickly, it's an old question. It's not the first time that people have asked this question about the United States as to its future and whether or not it's declining and whether its hegemony is something of the past, if not of the present or the future. Uh, for those of us long enough in the two, this, first, this question was first asked after the Vietnam War and throughout the 1970s. When the US was seen then, by the way, and I remember very well, was seen then, by the way, as losing the Cold War in the 1970s. Uh, the question was asked again, as you know, uh, in the second half of the 1980s by none other than that Brit export to Yale, Paul Kennedy, who spent a year here a couple of years back. Um, Paul Kennedy, of course, caused the storm when he wrote his big book, very big book with, I think, 4,712 footnotes, called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which was published in 1987. Now, you may ask the question, why did a book written by a Brit up in Yale caused such a storm because he added a chapter on the United States. And by adding that chapter on the United States, not only did he guarantee his book would be a bestseller around the world several times, he also meant that it would be taken seriously in the United States as well. Who, after all, wanted to find out about what happened to the Dutch and the Portuguese empires when he could find out about a much more interesting one called the American. And of course, in that particular book, which created a furore at the time in 1987 and afterwards and created a huge intellectual as well as a political backlash, as well as many who supported him. He argued, if you remember, that America was imperially overstretched. He added several other arguments, but broadly speaking, what, what Kennedy argued was that America isn't exceptional. It's like any other great power. It will follow the trajectories of every other great power in the past, from the Dutch to the British right through. Namely, it will mature, it will develop, and in time it will decline. It may decline slowly, it may decline nicely, like the British. It may decline in a fit of rage, like the French, but it will still, in the end, decline, however slowly and however relatively. Now, the book itself, of course, occasioned an enormous furore. Uh, Republicans came to hate him. Several books were written against him. Several articles were written against him. He wasn't quite exactly put on the House of Un-American Activities list, but nonetheless, he didn't make himself terribly popular with many in the United States. So, very simply, this question we're asking ourselves tonight is not a new one. Indeed, many people would ask, it's been asked before and it's been answered before. The answer is no. The answer is no. We've been here before, we've had this debate before, academics like me have stood up at occasions like this before, talked about this potentiality of decline, and we've all been proven wrong. If the past is a guide to all this, then we should learn from this past, and this past tell us, beware those who bear the argument, namely that the United States is in decline. Um, and there's, there's some good evidence to suggest that. There's some very good evidence to suggest that. Let me just deal with two big issues here. Firstly, look what happened after Paul Kennedy. He wrote the book in 1987, reasonably and confidently predicting that America was in decline, however relatively and however slowly, in 1988, deals began to be cut rather seriously between President Reagan and Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. In 1989, the whole of communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. If capitalism was in decline, or America was in decline at least more specifically, then it didn't really feel like it when the Berlin Wall came down at the end of 1989. Nor did it end there. Within a couple of years, America was showing its military prowess in Iraq expelling what was perceived then and understood to be the most significant of all military powers and armies in the Middle East and did it with relative ease, it seems now. Within a few months of that, the Soviet Union itself broke up, ending what we call the bipolar order. The other superpower was no more. 
China joined the world market, even if it did it under a, a far-seeing communist party, and one which had recently engaged in repression at Tiananmen Square. Planning as an economic alternative or as a system was abandoned around the world, except in uh, such uh, attractive countries as North Korea and Cuba. And whatever happened to the Japanese challenge to the United States, which also occasioned much of this discussion about American decline in the 1980s? Well, we know what happened. By 1990 and 1991, it was in a deep financial crisis. Assets in Japan collapsed. And in some senses, some would even argue Japan has never fully recovered from that lost decade. Indeed, many of the people talking about the United States today now point back to that experience of Japan to say that is where the world, or at least the United States, is going now. Europe, of course, in turn proved how useful it was militarily in former Yugoslavia. That, by the way, is an ironic statement. <laughs> and then, lo and behold, when Bill Clinton came to power in 1992, although it may not have been because of him, the American economy boomed for eight years. Solid results, 12 years, one year, one year, one year, eight solid years of growth. Unemployment came down, productivity rose. The American, the new American economy with its IT and dot-com boom, defined the new economy of the future. And to add to all this, globalization swept all before it, driven by the United States, and the English language swept the board. So, whatever happened to Paul Kennedy, not whatever happened to American decline. Certainly, if he had written that book in 1993, sales of it may not have been so great. Okay, you can then say, and maybe we could put the, put the argument like this, there's been a few problems since 2000, 2001. There's been a couple. Bush, 9-11, <laughs> crisis in Afghanistan, which still remains fundamentally unresolved, although we thought it was solved once. Iraq and all of its consequences for the stability of the Middle East and indeed for American soft power. Uh, a few financial problems, which uh, Danny has alluded to, and a certain loss of credibility. That's true. Still, you could still make the case, you could still make the case that none of this fundamentally, essentially, structurally, will effectively mean the end of the United States' number one power. In spite of all that, you could make this argument, you could make this particular argument. No other power, for instance, actually consciously seeks to replace the United States. China does not. The European Union uh, has a sense of humor, but not that much. <laughs> Russia, Russia, I think now, is not hardly a major challenger to the United States, particularly with oil prices being as low as they are. And as we all know, the Russian economy is a deeply unbalanced economy anyway. It doesn't have anything like the kind of varieties of power and extent of economic assets that China has. So no other power seeks to displace the United States or even consciously seeks. Indeed, as many people in the IR community would say, what we have seen over the last few years, even in spite of all these problems, is not an attempt to balance the power of the United States or challenge the power of the United States, but even throughout these troubles, most of the other powers have sought to bandwagon, to join up with the United States, whether China, uh, whether India, whether the European Union. This is not, therefore, a moment of transition in power terms. It could be argued very, very strongly. Uh, we are not living in a late 19th century moment, in other words, or even in a late 1945 period when the transition occurred overall between from the British Empire to an emerging uh, United States. Whatever one says about its economy, and Danny has made a very coherent argument about many of the problems of the American economy, and I love the idea of the IMF going to Washington and telling them what to do, the reality is that its economy still remains central. And in some senses, the economic crisis proves it. Um, if one had had a subprime crisis, let us just say, in Luxembourg or Belgium, or even, dare I say it, in the United Kingdom, um, it, would have had, it would have had local consequences. The very fact that the subprime crisis and then the financial knock-on from that into the finance and insurance business happened in America meant that it had global consequences. So the very fact of the crisis, the very fact that it began in the United States, actually proves how powerful the United States still is. It could have begun somewhere else, but because it began in the United States by definition of the size of the United States and its integration and size within the world economy, its consequences were therefore 
global. So even the crisis, in some odd and paradoxical way, proves the point about American power. The buggers began it, but it's because they are so large and so strong that we have to deal with it. Moreover, although there is much talk about asymmetrical warfare today, about what suicide bombers can do or not do, uh, what uh, jihadists might do or might not do militarily in terms of their attacks on the West and on the United States, when one adds up the basic facts of economic and military life, the United States is still an unrivaled military power. It still spends more on national security than any other all the other 15 powers put together. And finally, of course, it has, and this has been self-evident, it seems to me, to, to everybody over the last few months, it has an enormous capacity to recover and recuperate. And I think we've seen this at least at the political level since the election of last November when Barack Obama was elected. Um, everybody wishes they had their own Barack Obama. Well, they don't. Um, we have Berlusconi. <laughs> we have Gordon Brown. We have Sarko and his wife. <laughs> it, the, the point here is not simply a trivial or I hope amusing one, but you seem to be laughing, which cheers me up no end. It is simply this. It seems to me that no other country but the United States could have called forth someone like a Barack Obama. And I think this says something about the recuperative powers politically of the United States, which I think tells us a lot about the possibilities of recuperation of the system. And many would even argue, and take the argument further, and maybe Danny, can, we can deal with this in the Q&A, many would even argue that the American economy itself is so flexible, so mobile, so, so capable, of, of absorbing pain and remaining politically stable, that it itself will be able to recover from this long crisis sooner and more effectively than, say, the European Union or a number of other parts of the advanced industrial world. So we could argue, and indeed I think there's something to be made for the argument, that we've been here before in this decline debate, and the declinists have been proven wrong. Kennedy was proven wrong. Those who, after the Vietnam War in the 70s, said the United States and the American hegemonic moment was over, were proven wrong. Are we who would argue this case again today, are we going to be proven wrong as well? And the answer to that may well be yes. And secondly, and more generally, in spite of all the problems, and they are massive, they are massive, both political, security, and economic, facing the United States today, let us not underestimate the assets it possesses, the political system it has, the degree of stability it, 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 it effectively clearly has compared to, to Europe, and indeed its potential for recuperation. Don't write it off just yet. That's the kind of message I think you could get from many, many, from many, many uh, people, including, I think, to some degree myself. I think these are wise words, should not be ignored. Much truth in them. But also, and this is the kind of big however point, it does seem to me they ignore some really big changes uh, and problems facing the United States today. In some way, I think many of these deeper problems facing the United States have in some way been obscured by Barack Obama. He's played a brilliant game, a brilliant game. His intelligence, his charisma, his personal charm, and the bright light that currently shines out of the White House provides, I wouldn't say an illusion, but provides a chimera. It provides a sense that America's going somewhere and that many of these problems can be resolved precisely because Barack Obama is in the White House and he is the person he is. But Barack, as I've often been reminded, does not walk on water, nor can he simply wish away the combined challenges facing the USA in the longer term. And let me just deal with three of these very quickly. The first problem, as in spite of what I said earlier on, I don't think there's any necessary contradiction. The first problem stems from the economic crisis itself. Yes, America may recover from it earlier. It has enormous recuperative powers. It has the dollar. It can run these huge deficits. It can make everybody else buy its debts, including China and Japan. It can do all of these things, but this economic crisis still remains unresolved. 
And I think this economic crisis has been an especially devastating blow to the United States. Critically, it undermines its credibility as a model for the rest of the world. It undermines its credibility as a model for the rest of the world. Uh, a Clinton official in a recent article said it's been a major geopolitical setback for the United States, by which he meant not this had been a major military setback, or that it was now being challenged by al-Qaeda in a more aggressive fashion. It wasn't geopolitical in that sense, but it was a major geopolitical setback precisely because this economic model, which has been so much tied up with and identified, had become almost synonymous with the United States. That, is, that has been called into question both within the United States itself, as we can see from the policies of President Obama, and also around the world. A major geopolitical setback. Who will be copying the American free enterprise system over the next 25 years? Who will be emulating it? Who will be talking of it as the future? And that is important in terms of what we mean by hegemony. Who will be following this model any longer? Not many people, in my view. Not many people. Secondly, I think this crisis, going back to the specific question, uh, certainly robs the United States of a lot of resources to do foreign policy. I mean, simply the costs of dealing with this crisis are just gigantic. I mean, when you start adding up what the United States is having to spend by itself alone to prop up GM, to hold up the economy, to bail out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, all these kind of things added up together start to look like very serious money indeed. Very serious money indeed. Now, of course, the United States can run deficits and still run a foreign policy. The question is how effective that foreign policy can be in an age of such burgeoning and huge deficits. And it does seem to me it robs it of some of the resources to do foreign policy. And I think in a more existential way, and that's now the most favored word of everybody, existential, if you noticed, in some way, I think it also saps the political will, or at least detracts, takes away from focus. I think, in part, this explains the emerging Barack Obama foreign policy, with which I am broadly speaking in agreement, don't get me wrong. But a policy, it's, it's one not of disengagement or isolationism, but one which aims to engage with enemies rather than deal with them firmly. Set the reset button on Russia. Diplomacy towards Iran. Engage with former enemies try to solve the problems which have been left behind by the Bush administration. All entirely admirable and laudatory objectives, which I entirely agree. But nonetheless, it's much to be applauded, but there's a strong suspicion here that this is in part being driven by this economic crisis. In other words, what I'm trying to argue here is that there's a connection between the crisis and the resources, and the resources it has are diminishing, and as those resources diminish, then its capacity and ability to act I think it's diminished as well. Now, of course, many of us applaud this because we got so fed up with the Bush years. We, wanted more, we want more diplomacy, we want more engagement, we want more of the things that Barack is promising, but we've still got to look at it in terms of this, this, this notion of power, it seems to me, and I do think there is, there is something we need to deal with. And finally, what is striking about the current world position, made worse by the crisis that Danny so well described, is in fact, the more and more you look at this for a hegemon, one is struck and I certainly am strong, by how little the USA can in fact do, or in fact does. Not like a hegemon at all. And how much it is now having to rely more and more on others to get anything done. I suppose you may say, again, this is a good thing. We all love multilateralism. We all love international institutions. We think global governance is, is whoopee. You know, we can all kind of argue that this is a good thing. But the reality is that the United States is actually now facing a, 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 a double whammy from the point of view of being a hegemon. There are many things it simply cannot do, as we have discovered over Iraq, and we're increasingly discovering in Afghanistan, and we're discovering in terms of the world economic crisis. Or if it can do anything, it can only do it in association and in conjunction and in a and in serious consultation with other allies and indeed enemies as well. Now, you may say, well, this is clever hegemony. 
This is smart power. This is not doing what Bush did and made the United States lonely and indeed, under Bush at least, to some degree, uh, hated. Fair enough. Fair enough. But it isn't hegemony as we've understood it. It isn't hegemony, I think, as traditionally been understood as a hegemon, in a sense, shaping international rules, defining the rules of the game, and getting its own way when it wants to get its own way. The more it will consult good, the more it will consult less will its hegemony be hegemony, it seems to me. So, all problems come in threes, and I think this crisis and the general situation the United States faces means that the model it has espoused and championed for 25 years is no longer viable or attractive. The resources it has to do foreign policy have become less, and finally, what it can do is diminishing, and what it can do, it can only do effectively, increasingly, in serious consultation with others, as Danny has proven, or at least tried to argue, over China. Now, I, I end really with a, with a challenge, really, because William asked this question at the beginning, which is a very good question, well, can we live with it or can we live without it? Do we need it? What will we do if it ever goes? What do we do in a post-hegemonic world? It does seem to me a very, very important and difficult question to ask. Is it a good or a bad thing? Well, of one thing I'm certain, or as certain as I can be, because I've never been very good at prediction, uh, unlike most economists. Um, I had to get that cheap dig in, sorry about that. Um, not Danny, of course, not Danny. Um, I think the unipolar moment, if there ever was one in the 1990s, and I think it's always a problematic notion anyway, I think it's gradually withering away. America will in some sense remain number one, it will still remain dominant in, in census for economic reasons, the dollar, its military power, the size of its economy and all the rest of it. But I think its ability to exercise power in the sense that a hegemon can exercise or should, and, and indeed America has been able to exercise that power, it seems to me, is declining. In that sense, we are looking at a decline in hegemon. Yeah. It isn't going to go like the Turkish Empire in 1918 and collapse after a war. It isn't going to do Nostra Hungary on us. You know, it's not going to do what European empires did. In that sense, history is not a very good guide for the future. We've got to think creatively about what we mean by this specific form of decline in the modern world, and given that we're talking about the United States and not nation states like uh, empires uh, which I have mentioned. Is it a bad thing? Well, it, it could be a bad thing. Who knows? I mean, when other empires have fallen, it has not always led to progress and liberty uh, or, or, or anything else. If you think the world needs a hegemon, the question that at least William uh, asked at the beginning, then it will be a bad thing, because some would argue that stability in the world has been based upon this hegemony. And will we therefore move into a much more disorderly period without a hegemon? It's a big question. Whether you're pro or anti-American, it's, it's, it's an historical question to which I don't think there's very a, any easy answers. And if you think, after all, that the United States has been a good hegemon overall, that overall, under its benign leadership, good, bad, indifferent, bad presidents, stupid ones, clever ones, whatever, that overall its role in the world has been a broadly progressive one, which has delivered more peace, more justice, more democracy than any other hegemon we've ever had, at least in the 20th century, then indeed we'd have to worry about the decline of this hegemony. It could, however, be a good thing. And again, I kind of end on a very English note on the one hand, but on the other, which means I'm not answering the question. If you think we need more balance in the system, which many people would argue, that having a single dominant power like the United States is unnatural, is likely to lead to the kinds of dangers and hubristic moments which we saw over Iraq, then it's a bad thing. If you think we need more sharing of power in the system, which I think many people are now arguing for, particularly in the context of this crisis, then it's a good thing. Bad or good, I think, however, the answer to the question, is it a declining hegemon? Yes, but it's going to do it in a very distinct American way. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a very provocative double act to open up. And what I'm going to do is to take comments and short questions in threes, and I will abuse the chair and, uh, and make the first one, which is to disagree with Mick that uh, the, the, the passage from British hegemony to American hegemony came after 1945. Actually, as I interpret the history of that period, the British lost uh, their hegemonic position between 1914 and 1920, and they then followed a 15-year period uh, without 
a global hegemon, and it wasn't a very comfortable one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the question that we now face is either, uh, we have three options. One, in spite of everything, the United States continues to provide global agenda sh setting in a more multilateral context, but because the United States is the only country which thinks geopolitically, mm. Europeans and others simply do not, the United States remains the global agenda setter, or we have to find another. And the question of whether China is, is willing to take that on is a very large one, or we somehow have to find a mechanism for collective global management. And just to add to that, um, it's very striking, I think, that, that the Chinese authorities kept saying that they did not want to become a member of G8. They did not want to take on wider responsibilities, uh, that they don't want to talk about the problem of security in Africa or the wider <laughs> issues, that they are, as Danny Whiteley said, driven above all by economic growth and by dom the domestic imperatives of that. Mm. Everyone sketches out a global agenda in which climate change, uh, sustainable economic development, population growth and the migration implications of that, um, Islamic terrorism and the instability of some major parts of the world need to be managed collectively. The question of how one co-opts other countries into this collective management is a, is a by large one. Danny may say, well, actually, if you look at Chinese ships off East Africa, the 1,500 Chinese troops and UN forces in the Lebanon, et cetera, it's beginning. But that seems to be, to be the, the, the area we have to, to open up. Um, now, <coughs> let me just take a couple more comments, and then we'll throw, throw this back to the panel. Question, question or comment there? Um, my question is primarily to Professor Kwa. Wouldn't he agree that um, we shouldn't be dazzled by Barack Obama, as his wife rightly said, he's just a man? Um, isn't the crucial point here that we've yet to see Washington, a combination of Congress and the White House, not getting to grip with the toxic assets issue? Would he agree with Treasury Geithner's comments this week that in view of the fact he's admitted the Federal Reserve, uh, unlike Greenspan and Bernanke, that the Federal Reserve ran uh, a monetary policy far too loose, it's likely to be far tighter. Doesn't he agree that the dollar is likely to decline in value? And what are his views on it being replaced or being another international reserve currency? Ah, another part of the hegemony question or post-hegemony question. Yes, I'll take the one, uh, the, the, the hand in the second row there. Uh, hi, thanks for a, a lecture, a student at, at LSE. I had two questions. First of all, uh, Professor Kuo, you focused on uh, how uh, China as a, as a global economic manager might be preferable to uh, the US. But um, since uh, the US does exercise its exorbitant privilege at, at being able to borrow as much as it wants um, without, uh, how, and being able to transfer the cost to other countries, uh, how likely is that of actually uh, kind of occurring without touching the subject of whether or not it would be preferable or not? And then secondly, to Professor Cox, um, I think it's pretty clear that um, the, you know, the unipolar moment, if there ever was one, is over. But is, will a Samuel Huntington-style uni-multipolar world uh, decline uh, anytime soon, considering that uh, in, in, you know, in Europe and uh, in Latin America, in the key areas of United States allies, there's pretty much mostly pro-American uh, governments in power, and the trend seems to be uh, foreseeable into the future. Thank you. Right. Gosh. Okay. Glad to go. Well, let me have a quick go. I'll have a quick go at you first, William, for getting it wrong. <laughs> um, uh, Edmund Burke, the great Irishman, said the real transition from the British to the American Empire actually began in 1776 <laughs> with the American War of Independence. And being a fine Irishman, like my mother, well, she was an Irish woman, of course, uh, <laughs> he's bound to be right. Uh, of course, there is another point of transition, which is 1898. That's always another good date when the United States uh, liberates. Uh, Cuba and the Philippines, and that's also seen as a moment of transition globally, when the British establishment wakes up to the fact that there's a, this vast power across the Atlantic and they have to come to terms with it. Um, okay, I chose the obvious one of 1945 because I'm a kind of fairly obvious person. Uh, but the real, the real point is this, 
at least there were, whether we say it's 1776 a la Edmund Burke or 1898 or whether we say it's 1945 the transition, there was a transition to happen. That was the point I was really trying to drive at. There was a transition you could think of from one power declining in some way or another and working out the deals and the modalities, if you wish, to a transition to another hegemon. That is what you don't see now. That's what makes this moment different. It doesn't seem to me there's anybody else waiting around on the horizon, desperately keen to grab the baton, you know, to take it over. And that seems to me why history doesn't help us. And that's, that's the point I was really trying to get. S secondly, I've never understood or A, agreed or B, understood Samuel Huntington. Um, <laughs> not that I want to speak ill of the dead, but I've never understood what the conception of a uni-multipolar world meant. I've read that article in, in several languages, including English, and um, <laughs> I just don't understand what it means. I mean, if he means there's one big one and a lot of medium-sized ones, well, why didn't he damn well say that <laughs> in the first place and stop confusing us and giving IR a bad name? Um, but I do think it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that. I just, I just don't know what any longer a unipolar world actually means, I suppose. I mean, Sam Huntington, dear man, you know, wanted to hang on to the uni bit. I think it's the uni bit, in spite of all the things I've added together to say there's still a lot of assets there, there's still a lot of capabilities there. I'm not sure what the uni bit now means as he meant it writing back in the early 1990s. That's the point I'm really trying to get at. You can have all the power in the world, but if you can't achieve things, you're in trouble. If you need to depend on others to achieve things, then you're no longer in a classical sense a hegemon. If you don't have the capacity to do things because of the economic situation you now find yourself in because simply the costs now of simply re recovering and saving the American economy are now so astronomic, as Danny pointed out, that I do think there's a, there's a, there's a problem, of cap there's a capabilities gap here, which I do think is significant. It's going to affect aid, it's going to affect a whole bunch of things as to whether the United States, and I know I've always been very skeptical of this idea, by the way, that America couldn't afford to be. I am now less skeptical of, of that argument. Okay. If I can try and address, if I can try and address the, the raft of questions up until now in two blocks. Uh, first, the questions about currency and about the likelihood of a Chinese world leadership, mm. as well as the question of what it means to live in a world without a hegemon. Now, William has pointed out that in the interwar period, that was exactly a time when we had one of these. And it was not a comfortable time. But lots of other things happened in the interwar period. A Great Depression, where economic leadership was totally absent. And it was not clear at that point, given the knowledge that we had, what economic leadership from a hegemon would have looked like. The rest of this question might be treated by going back to what Professor Cox described as would have been my answer to the Queen's question, <laughs> why did not anyone notice that this was happening? Now, far be it from, for me to report on private conversations between one's monarch <laughs> and oneself, but I can tell you that if the Queen, in the hypothetical situation, that the Queen might have asked, why didn't anyone see this coming? A reply might have taken the following form. <laughs> might have. Really. Actually, everybody saw it coming. <laughs> every policymaker, every national policymaker, worth the weight, every central banker, worth the salt, saw the huge imbalance that was emerging between the US balance of trade and pretty much everywhere else in the rest of the world. The people who saw this coming and raised alarm bells were quite quietly patted on the back and said, this is not a problem. We have, the world has been like this for the last 15 years now and there is no issue. The countries that are in surplus have no obligation to the rest of the world economy to correct that surplus. They're simply accumulating claims on the rest of the world to save for the future. The countries, well actually there's only one country, 
the country that was running huge deficits that should have been corrected by an appropriate international monetary authority like the IMF or by Bretton Woods type institutions saw no need to adjust its behavior because who was going to tell it to devalue its currency? It held the world's reserve currency. Now, transport that situation, that scenario, to 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and imagine if the United States hegemon remains. And ask yourself, what adjustments will be needed at that point? The quick answer is no gradual adjustments, because we will be in exactly the same situation as we found ourselves in 2006. There will be people crying out alarms. They will be quietly ignored because no one sees a reason to adjust except that one country that is totally immune from, from calls for it to adjust. The fact that in the interwar period there was no hegemon led to a period of unhappiness in the world does not mean that when there is a hegemon, we will not have even worse <laughs> problems of unhappiness. And so I beg you to consider the possibility that an economic hegemon like China that is sensitive to economic imbalances and that will seek to put in place institutions to adjust them might actually be preferable on purely economic grounds, if nothing else. I am amused slightly by Professor Cox's interpretation of the current global economic crisis as providing evidence for first, the centrality of the US economy, and second, for presenting to us a view that the current global economic crisis is, my goodness, a major geopolitical setback for the United States. It is as if we were circling that patch of icy ocean and witnessing the sinking of the Titanic. <laughs> this massive ocean liner is slowly tipping over and sinking beneath the waves. It is threatening the lives of thousands of people, not least the fragrant Kate Winslet <laughs> and the beautiful Leonardo DiCaprio. And all that we can say is the fact that we are all looking at this indicates what a massive engineering miracle the Titanic must be because otherwise we would not be standing around looking at this. <laughs> That's the point. That is my point. That and is my point. <laughs> And second, what a terrible public relations setback for Acme Brunel Engineering Company, or whichever it was, that ha built the ha Titanic. Holland and Wolf yes, Belfast. That yes. one. <laughs> I suggest that we should take stock of our priorities, if that is how we view the current global economic crisis. Question from Robert. All right, so my first point is this. I think it takes You didn't get them from you didn't get them from just one country gobbling up. You also got them from China's economics incentives, and they, they like you mentioned, they wanted to grow, right? So they put their money where they wanted. Uh, it, there's, I won't go into the, the many global amounts of things. I think you know that better than I do. Um, and the second thing is that you allude to the fact that China is this peaceful actor and can be an economic peaceful actor, and. I, want you, I would like to know a little more about that because if, you're, if a country is solely based on economic growth, aren't they, and they're not um, a democrat, necessarily a democratic country, um, aren't they likely to neglect humanitarian issues in nations such as Africa, possibly, um, and for a number of other um, issues, but just alluding to that one. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was revising Fall of the Roman Empire today for my, um, econo uh, for my um, exams, and I was wondering if there's a chance for America to, America to recover its position in, you know, in, in the world, or whether you know, the last eight years of Bush were kind of were the commodus of the American empire, and it's now just on a gradual steady decline where there might be a few 
you know, peaks, you know, if we, it might come up again with like, you know, another Constantine or something like that, but it's just a gradual decline into, you know, nothingness. I, I mean, I want to know whether there's a chance at recovery or is it just, I mean, an inevitable decline? Fine. Question down here. All the speakers have said, you know, prediction is, is a very uh, rum business. But uh, and I'm sure in the next 25 years, taking a very long-term view regarding China, what, what is, I mean, there are a number of scenarios that people have spoken about. Uh, is China going to be a problem for the West? Could they, could they be an investor strike? There are still people in the U.S. who are, frankly, paranoid about China, and I've heard people, some Republicans say, in the next 25 years, China is going to be a political, military, and economic threat to the U.S., and we've got to take it out somehow or other. Are we going to be talking ourselves into a situation that's happened before 1914, where Germany was a rising power, and everyone was getting paranoid about their positions, situation, and we could end up with, you know, just sleepy walking into a military conflict. Is that realistic or am I, is it nonsense? Danny, I think you start in response, and I have to say, I was a little puzzled when you said China is an economic hegemon, hegemon which is sensitive to economic imbalances. I would have thought one could have said China is, is an economic hegemon which is the source of a lot of the world's economic imbalances. Just go that one as an extra, which is part of my question. Yes. May I speak? Of course. <laughs> you're, the, you're the Titanic here. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get back on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for those, all those interesting questions. Yes, it does take two to tango. And yes, uh, there is a lot of press about how China is the mirror image of the US current account deficit. But here's a fact that might not be as well known and that does not show up in the press quite so often. The current account deficit that the United States was running against the world is matched in rhythm, pace, direction, and magnitude, not just by China, but also in the US current account deficit against Germany, the US current account deficit against the European Union, the US current account deficit against the Gulf countries and most commodity producing countries. It was not just a tango, it was a T-Mobile flash mob dance <laughs> in the Liverpool street station. <laughs> and everybody was involved. But I put at the center of all this, the United States, the Titanic of the ballroom, on whether China's increasing influence elsewhere in the world will lead it to perhaps the same excesses as um, the United States has, has engaged in. Well, you know, I have a slightly different view than perhaps others on what the U.S. excesses in foreign policy have been like. I think there's an interpretation of U.S. foreign policy that, that says it has been driven inextricably by a belief in that nation's historical, by a historic global significance. The U.S. will consistently intervene and overthrow sovereign governments, and has already done so dozens of times throughout its history. Wars that defend the principles of the United States can be viewed to be correct, even if established international law says that they are wrong. There are elements of US foreign policy that have to be interpreted as saying that international institutions should not be allowed to hamper US interventions in foreign countries. Now contrast that with what China has done in Africa. China, native Chinese-born Chinese nationals, 
now number 750,000 in Africa. There are 900 Chinese companies operating in Africa now, investing up to 6 billion US dollars. Dozens of Chinese engineers, construction workers have died building highways and railroads in Africa when attacked by rebels. The perception within Africa of how China deals with it is uniform, whether it is pronounced by those who are viewed as enemies of the West or those who are viewed as friends of the West. And that is that China comes to Africa to do business and it treats the African states as equals, not as people to be dealt with summarily and roughly. I think that that kind of economic playing field is much preferred to ones that we have experienced in the past. The point about whether the current um, global crisis is simply a temporary setback in US economic progress and that the US economy will recover eventually. It might well be because as Professor Cox has pointed out, we have already had a dozen false alarms proclaiming the decline of the US hegemon. But at some point, when the transition in global economic power hands over from one country to a different part of the world, at some point, we will see signals pretty much the same as we see now. And at some point, those signals will be the right ones. China's growth, if you play a game with me, if you take the world's economic center of gravity, where you average across planet Earth production and consumption that occurs in different parts of the world, in the last 20 years, the world's economic center of gravity has drilled 1,500 kilometers, 30% of the Earth's radius, into the center of the Earth and eastwards, away from the United States and towards China, and currently shows no sign of reversing itself. I don't think that kind of a shift in the world's economic center of gravity has ever been observed in the modern era. And at some point we have to say, after being cautious because we realize we've been wrong the last dozen times, this time, this might be it. Thank you very much. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be brief because a lot of people have got their hands up. I, I would point out to Danny that the Titanic was a really good boat. It just had a rotten captain. Uh, <laughs> And it was, by the way, built in Belfast, just to point out that. But anyway, I, I mean, firstly, um, which may tell its own story. Um, I, don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything contradictory in what I said on this, by the way, Danny, just to, just to just respond to your point there. I mean, it seems to me, on the one hand, the, uh, the, we couldn't have had this economic crisis in, in, in the form it's taken or the, gl the global ramifications it has taken if it had not begun in the United States. That's the point I'm really trying to make. It's, that, that simply tells you something about this, the importance of the United States. Paradoxically, the very crisis it has helped create tells us something about the, the sheer importance and centrality of the United States in the international economic system. That is not, that is not a contradiction, but in saying at the same time, this is then a, a major geopolitical setback for the United States. I just don't see a contradiction in the arguments. I'm simply making two point, two parts of a, of a, of a kind of, uh, uh, an argument. So I'd, I'd, st I'd stick with that, and I'm, 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 I'm glad you're amused. But I do think I do think I'm right, and you're wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm bound to say that. On the question of China, which has come up time and time again, um, look, I don't think we're like 1914. I mean, and if we are, then you know, let's let's really go to the country and stay there. Um, but I just don't think we are. I think you know, I mean, without going into too much kind of IR410 kind of international relations, you know, for, 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 the, for the master students, too much has changed to make it like 1914. Um, and indeed, I'd also say, and maybe in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a defense of the Chinese leadership, the Chinese leadership don't want this either. I mean, they've been absolutely clear in their own minds. And they read history, they know history, they're very historically minded leadership. And they know what has happened before when other great powers have risen, and it's ended in disaster. 
particularly the, the ones we're talking about pre-1914. Pre and we've got to kind of give here, therefore, some degree of role of agency, the, the role of consciousness, the role of intelligence, the role of reading history for once at last correctly. And I think the Chinese have. And, uh, and also they're very self-interested. I mean, you know, they know that this continuing economic... Uh, this economic machine that they've created, a highly successful one, depends on a, on a benign, peaceful international environment. Yeah. Uh, and they're very well aware of that. They're very well aware that you can create your own security dilemma. And they're trying to escape it. And so far, they've been damn successful at doing so. And may they long continue to do so. And this has been particularly important, Danny knows this better than I do, in Southeast Asia. Uh, where in the, in the early 1990s, when they had less power, less influence, they were more feared than they are now when they have more power. And the reason for that is they've clearly made a conscious adjustment, particularly after the financial crisis in East Asia after 1997, to make sure that all the boats will rise together and China will be seen, and not as the Titanic about to sink, but, but, as, but as the good ship, you know, lead, 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 leading the rest. Now, from the point of view, whether there's an American paranoia about this, I think you've got to be a bit careful. There are, of course, certain writers in the United States, and I know many of them myself, you know, who do worry for varieties of different reasons about the rise of China. They either argue that when hegemons rise, it always leads to conflict. History repeats itself. I don't agree with that. Uh, secondly, they say you can't trust the communists. Well, fair enough, but the Communist Party of China seems to be much better at running capitalism than the capitalists, <laughs> which I think was really Danny's point. Um, the point is this, it seems to me. And I think Dan is absolutely right to, to stress this. I mean, we could obviously talk more about the, the role of the European Union, which has got bad short shrift this evening. But if China and the United States and the United States and China don't get it right, we're in trouble. I mean, it's as simple as that. If one or the other gets the other one wrong in this most important moment of transition, then we're, we're in real trouble. That, therefore, requires China effectively to rise within the American-led system. Or within an American-defined system. I maybe put it like that, Danny, rather than an American-led system. But it would then also require the United States to do something which actually hegemons in the past have not been very good at, which actually means sharing power and distributing the power to reflect these new realities. And that's going to be the, most, the, the, greatest, the greatest challenge the greatest challenge of all. On, on the question of China, again, I'm not, I'm not an apologist for any of it, no more than Danny is, but there seems to be there's no fundamental question in the world we can solve today without China. It's as simple as that. I mean, whether you come to North Korea on hard security, whether you come to global warming issues, whether you come to this current financial economic crisis, it doesn't matter. And, and I think Barack Obama understands that perfectly well. At the G20, you know, frankly, he didn't want to meet Gordon Brown, although he couldn't get out of the way of Gordon Brown. <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to meet President Hu Jintao. You know, he, and, and that's who they wanted to meet as well. And this is, uh, this is the realities we've got to deal with about managing that transition not from one power to another, by, by the, but, but more in terms of whether we can get a sharing of power between the two, it, it seems to be. Can the United States, will it inevitably decline? That was kind of, will, it, will it sink into nothingness? No, I hardly imagine so. I mean, a country of 300 million people with that economy, with the dollar still center, its military capability, this extraordinary energy of the United States. It did produce a Barack Obama, it still produces more things in many ways more productively than many other countries in the world. And there are many countries in the world today, even without Barack Obama, who highly admire the United States. The best way of measuring that is that people still want to go there. You know, people still want to go there and, and work there, and not, not just uh, the poor and the, dis, the dispossessed. However, but the more and more I go to the United States, and I've visited several times this year, the more, and whether it's inevitable or long-term, I just don't know. I just don't know. But I do think, and I may be wrong on this, I just feel a psychological, there's been a psychological shift in America amongst so many Americans, which I've never seen before, frankly, over the, over the last two years, since the beginning of the crisis in September 2007, through the Lehman's brother collapse effectively last year with all the implications of that right through to now. I think there's a kind of psychological shift which has actually taken place within the United States. Uh, I do think there's a, there's a mood of pessimism, there's, there's a mood that they can no longer control this world and in, and in an economy where you lost three quarters of a million jobs last month, they do know that something big has happened as a result of this world financial crisis and that's what I was really trying to drive at. Now, we ought to finish before 
by, by eight at the latest, and I know there are lots of other people. So can I ask for three very rapid comments, um, and then I'll have rapid comments on it. Uh, the, the young woman there. Okay, you got or, or got that? Has how far has globalization changed the limits to power of economic actors? Um, I'll take that one up there. Hi. Um, in the in the big picture of uh, of Chinese history, um, when have they ever really expressed any interest in what was happening in the rest of the world? I mean, a hegemon isn't just somebody who who's a big economic power. It's somebody who really wants to, wants to influence what's going on elsewhere. When's China ever really shown any interest in what was going on elsewhere? Uh, I mean, almost the first book I read in international relations was called The Chinese View of Their Place in the World. <laughs> yes. Is there, is there a, a potential catalyst you think that could precipitate uh, uh, a quicker change in the world order? Say that again, sorry. Is there a potential, is there a potential catalyst, catalyst that might on precipitate horizon. a more rapid change. Exactly. In, that we are yes, if there's only a trigger event which might shift things in one direction or another. Good. God. You um, first, then. Right, OK, catalyst. Well, I mean, oh, God, what are you doing? Um, British Prime Minister, wasn't it? I always used, whenever I can't think, I always think of a British Prime Minister. Harold Macmillan, you know, said events, dear boy, events. Um, you know, any, any, any number of events can come along to derail any amount of carefully constructed predictions about the future. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, suddenly political events in Taiwan could destabilize China. Who knows? Uh, some American public opinion could suddenly be turned by events in Tibet. If Tibet got very unpleasant, deeply unpleasant, where we saw mass repression, which we haven't seen so far. We've seen repression, but not mass repression. Who knows? Um, who knows? I mean, we could get another series of major terrorist attacks over, over a, number of, a number of cities. Uh, in, in, some, in some way, I think, the, uh, the crisis we are now in is very much, in part, in part, a product of 9-11. Um, because immediately after 9-11, Alan Greenspan, that person I call the man who combines Harry Potter with Superman, um, <laughs> I mean, he looks like Harry Potter, and everybody believed he was Superman. Um, you know, what he immediately did after 9-11. I mean, you know, he pushed down interest rates as fast as possible, which he'd been doing anyway. And, uh, of course, he, he poured liquidity into the international system. So he put off a crisis. In some sense, you could say, for the last eight, nine years, I mean, it goes back to Danny's point, we've been putting off this crisis by a variety of measures, but they're not very, they're not very original ones. You simply lower interest rates, make money cheap, and then flood the world with liquidity because you actually fear something very, very bad is coming towards you. And the more we've deferred the problem, the greater the problem has been. And be, that would be my take on it, Danny, you may disagree. But you could get something like that again, which could have all sorts of consequences. Uh, we, could see, we could even see, and this gets back to the China question, again, don't want to focus overly on China. The biggest threat to the United States arising from China is not the threat of China's power rising, it is of a Chinese collapse. You know, and if, frankly, if I was, <laughs> If, and, I, and I know that this is certainly how many people inside this administration think a great deal, that what they're deeply worried about, whether realistically or not, Daniel, you know more about this than I do, is not China rising, but China falling. And that tells us a lot about the world we're now living in, and that we're less worried about the rising of China, as long as right, China can rise within a, in a kind of system. So there could be all sorts of catalytic changes, you know, which could bring it about, even a change of president. Let's be honest. I mean, nobody ever thought George Bush was going to get elected in 2000. Indeed, he didn't think he was going to be elected in 2000. Indeed, the majority of Americans didn't vote for him anyway in 2000, but he still took over the White House. And that has consequences, because he brought up the Iraq war. And I don't think it would have happened under the Democrats. So, um, China's interest in the world, I'll leave to, to, to Danny on globalization and power. Well, that's, <laughs> you must be doing a question on that in your exams. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of, I, I kind of, A, believe globalization is true, but B, I'm enough of a realist to know that power matters. And uh, I, I just don't see the necessary conflict or contradiction between the two. I mean, without the United States, I don't think you'd have had globalization in the first place. I mean, without the driver after 
I mean, effectively, what the United States did after 1945 is reconstitute an, as much as it could an open world economy, uh, yeah. given, given the autarkic collapse that had happened in the 1930s. It, but it understood that the, the need for an open world economy. You know, that, all, that, old, uh, that wonderful old phrase of Cordell Hull's, when, uh, when goods don't cross frontiers, soldiers and armies will. So we've needed power to drive globalization. Now, the real question, it seems to me, um, is whether without American leadership, globalization continues. Now, this is where China comes in. But globalization is at large, is, I say at large, but is at the moment under threat. It does seem to me there are some genuine challenges to globalization. I said when the debate here with David Held, this has been my last point. You know, in the old days, we used to debate globalization. Is it good? Is it bad? When did it begin? When should it end? Is it good for your genes? You know, that kind of thing. You know, blah, blah, blah. Should you buy genes? I mean, blue genes. Um, you know, do you believe with Martin Wolf that it's an unalloyed wonder? Or do you believe with David Held, a good friend? You know, you've got to regulate it. You know, we could debate. Now there's a different question about globalization. Will it continue? I, I overall feel that it will, but it is now much more under challenge. And it's under challenge at the very moment when American power is under challenge. And the two things, it seems to me, are connected. Done. <clears throat> potential catalyst that might tip us over. Well, you see, the instant we get an event like a Hurricane Katrina sweep through New York City or Washington, D.C., <laughs> the Not fact of global climate change will be impressed on <laughs> everyone. The U.S. has not driven the agenda on global climate change the way that it has done on many other things. The instant that oil and energy and hydrocarbon fuels, you know, the efficient compressed forms that they take, become viewed as being ever more under threat. Well, you know, we know that last summer the price of hydrocarbon fuels went through the roof. We know that the price of food went through the roof. The United States, in an ill-judged attempt to switch uh, its corn production, its corn harvest, to, uh, to, to ethanol biofuel production, instead of simply importing it from Brazil, we realized that these large changes can occur, that then, you know, the global economic crisis then took over and we stopped experimenting with that. You know, that might have been a badly judged experiment, but it was something that saw huge changes occur. I think something like that could well take place very easily, and we will see massive changes in the global economic order, global international order. Has China ever shown an interest in the rest of the world? Well, you see, there are two sides to this. One is we cannot criticize China for not doing the right thing in the Sudan, for not doing the right thing in Darfur, or not doing the right thing in Tibet, if we think that Tibet is part of, you know, the over outside of China. And at the same time, suggest to it that it might want to take a greater interest outside of its borders. Its history is checkered on this. As we know, in the 13th century, long before the East India Company of its different manifestations went out in search of spices in, well, in my part of the world, China's sailors had already explored a lot of Africa. But nowhere in China's history was there an attempt to colonize the world. Nowhere has, that, has it shown the kind of belligerence towards the rest of the world that we have seen manifest from other global powers. And so I think that its history actually shows that it engages with the rest of the world in a peaceful, economically driven way with no ambitions beyond that. I think that will be a happy outcome if more of the world realizes that and practices that as well. Has globalization changed the limits to power? Now my answer to Professor Cox's exam question would be yes, but then I'm afraid I'm out of time, so I cannot complete the rest of this essay. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I, I once had a Chinese girlfriend, and amongst uh, the, 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 the many other things that she said, uh, was to point out that, that, that uh, the Chinese were actually, in many ways, infinitely superior to Europeans. Europeans are hairier and smellier, and therefore clearly less evolved than Chinese. I leave you with that for oh, the Chinese uh, intellectual oh, hegemony. <laughs> and I'd like to thank our speakers very much for that provocative uh, debate, which has not left us with clear conclusions. But uh, all of you can think of potential tipping points and catalysts, which we hope will not shift current developments, but which might. And I have one final thought, that as I look at the United States and China, present moment and how, what they need to do domestically as well as globally, one of the interesting questions is, will the United States develop an effective 
domestic public health service before China does? <laughs> or will China finally get round to introducing one of the things that one might have thought any socialist uh, system ought to have in the first place? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.